So we're going to start with today's sermon coming from Daniel chapter 1. Okay? Daniel chapter 1. If you go ahead and turn in your Bibles, I think it's on page 625 if you're using the Bibles provided in the pew. Look at Daniel chapter 1. In these times, Daniel. Now Daniel is one of those books that we know, but only in part. We only know part of Daniel. Daniel can be divided up into two ways. Basically divided into two parts. The first part of Daniel is stories. They're narratives like, like 80% of the rest of the Bible. And we know those stories. We enjoy those stories. So that part we know, but not well. We don't handle that part very well at all. We handle it quite badly. When we read these stories, we... we we tend to, like we normally do, is moralize. Okay, we tend to moralize on these stories. You know, dare to be a Daniel. Anyone remember that song? Dare to be a Daniel, dare to stand alone. And look at Daniel and how good he is. Daniel and his friends. We tend to moralize, and we know better than that. We know better. We know we should not moralize, right? That moralizing is bad, or we ought not moralize. We know better than that. And as we read a little bit more carefully those portions of Daniel, we see that Daniel is about God. Daniel is a story about God. Daniel and his friends, they're, they're characters in the stories. Or better put, they are participants in the historical events that Daniel writes about. But the book itself is about God. It's not about Daniel and his friends. And one problem we have is when we start moralizing those type stories, what are we doing? We're putting ourselves in the story. So then what are we saying? We're saying the story is about who? Us. Okay, and that's just wrong. Okay, let's keep the story about God. So, but that part of the story we know. Okay, we know that part of Daniel. We mess it up and it's the easy part, right? The other half part of Daniel is about dreams and visions and their interpretations. Okay, and those get rather difficult. Sure, I'll take them. I don't know what page I'm on now, but that's fine. But those get difficult to handle. Now I know who took them away from me. Nate. <laughs> Nate did, huh? And so where was I? Okay. Oh, we're in that second part of Daniel. It's about the, the dreams and the visions. And we don't handle that well at all. Many of us don't even try to understand it. Many of us go out and buy a good study Bible that has notes telling us how to interpret those signs and visions and what they mean, right? And after all, that's okay because they don't have any real meaning today, right? They're all about the end times. Isn't it amazing that we're okay with that? Isn't it amazing that we're okay with the fact that God inspired a book to be written 25, 2600 years ago? And it's all about the end times. That's wrong. Okay, Daniel, the book of Daniel, the entire book of Daniel, both halves of Daniel, had real meaning for the exiles. It had real meaning for them at the time it was written, and it has real meaning for us today. So, now I've talked long enough, everyone should have found it now, right? Let's go ahead and start reading. I'm going to be reading out of the Holman Christian Standard Version. I'm going to read, uh, start reading in chapter 1. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and laid siege of it. The Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to him, along with some of the vessels of the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of his God, and put the vessels in the treasury of his God. The king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his court officials, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men without any physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, and capable of serving in the king's palace to teach, to teach them the Chaldean language and literature. The king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank. 
They were to be trained for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to serve in the king's court. Among them from the descendants of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief officials gave them different names. To Daniel, he gave the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. The Lord bless this, the reading of His Word. So as we look at Daniel, as we read Daniel, let me just tell you right now, I, I'm really looking forward to this message. And the message means, has an entirely different significance to me today than it did this morning when I last read it. Okay, so if, if I get choked up a little bit, <laughs> bear with me, okay? So it's 3 o'clock in the morning. You're sitting there by yourself, and you haven't been able to sleep. You can't sleep. You're still waiting. You're worried. So your, your son and his family were going to be driving down to visit you for Mother's Day. And they were due in at 8. And they're still not there. You've tried calling. They don't answer their phones. You wonder why he finally started listening to you all those times you told him not to talk on his phone while he's driving. It's not a good time to start listening. Since about 10 o'clock, you've been really worried. You've been started worrying. He's been about the past five hours in prayer praying that God's protect him. And that's always worked in the past. God's always been there to protect your family. He's always been there for you. And so you turn to him one more time. So here it is, about three. You've spent the past five hours in prayer. And then you see the reflection of the headlights up on the wall. And you start feeling that, that sense of joy. They're here. You, you mess up your hair and throw away the coffee so they don't know you've been up all night, right? And then you go run into the door, open the door, and there stands a police officer. Is it Mr. White? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, there's been an accident. And then you hear those terrible words, and there are no survivors. How do you feel? What are the feelings that are in your head right now? What are your thoughts? What are your thoughts? Where do you turn to? Do you turn to God? Can you turn to God at this point? Or do you not want to? Because He let you down. Why turn to God? I mean, does He even exist? After five hours of prayer and then you get this? What are your feelings? Total despair? Whatever the feelings you feel right now, I'll tell you, they don't even measure up to the feelings that Daniel and his countrymen had as they were hauled off in chains. As they were hauled off in chains to a new country. Being hauled away as to put it bluntly, not even just slaves, now worse than slaves, they're being hauled away as living trophies. Living trophies. And if you look there in uh, whatever verse that was, uh, verse 3, the king ordered Ashpenaz, the chief of his, of his court, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family, okay, this is the royal family, in line for the kingship, uh, from the nobility, young men without physical defect, good-looking, suitable for instruction of all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive. Uh, there were some very, very strict guidelines of who he was bring away. These were, these were the cream of the crop. These are living trophies that they're being hauled off as. And not only are they being hauled off as trophies, but look there and. The last half of verse 2, it says that along with some of the vessels from the house of God. 
the vessels, the, the fixtures, the silver cups, the, the items from the temple are being hauled off too. And Daniel and his friends, Daniel and his country knew, knew what that meant. See, in the ancient Near East, when you had one kingdom conquering another kingdom, it wasn't a matter of one king battling the other king. It wasn't a matter of a kingdom battling a kingdom. It was also a matter of one God defeating the other God. So as Nebuchadnezzar and his army defeated Jerusalem, or yeah, Jerusalem, Judah, it was also looked at their God was defeated. And so as Daniel and his friends are hauled off for human trophies, they see the fixtures from the temple brought with them, and they know that they're going to be placed in these pagan temples in a position so that their God, the defeated God, would be able to worship the triumphant God. So they also knew that their God was being hauled off as a trophy. You see, Daniel and his friends, they were living this situation. They were living through it. They weren't reading it. I'm sorry, Greg, did I, did I go beyond my bounds there? You, you define it for me here. Okay? Okay. They, they were living this. They weren't reading it. So they didn't have verse 2. Okay, they didn't have verse 2 where it says, the Lord handed Jehoiakim, king of Judah, over to Nebuchadnezzar. They didn't know that God was involved here. So as they're being hauled off, what are their questions? What are their questions? I think very similar to mine at 3 o'clock in the morning. Is my God really God? Is God really God? And if so, can He rescue me? In light of my, cert, my today's circumstances, in, in light of the situation I'm in now, can God rescue me? Can He forgive me? Can He redeem me? So is my God really God? And can He redeem me? So let's take a look at verse 2 first. Verse 2 says, The Lord, and we're going to stop right there. The Lord. Daniel is going to emphasize the answer to that question right here. Daniel uses the word Lord, okay, Adne, which is the word for the sovereignty. The Lord, not God, but Lord. The person in charge, the sovereign being. And he also, throughout the book of Daniel, Daniel emphasizes by it's the God or the Lord, not just Lord or God. Okay, so Daniel says, the Lord handed Jehoiakim over to Nebuchadnezzar. And we see this throughout the book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, as we'll learn, just screams that yes, our God is God. Our God is in control. Our God is the sovereign. And we know this. We know this. But to be honest, if we're honest with ourselves, we know that there are times where, you know, we, we deep inside we think, yes, our God is in control. And he's in control as long as things go the way we agree with God they should go. Right? At times when life doesn't go the way we think it should go, what's the first question we ask? Why God? Or where was God? That's always a big question. Where was God when this happened? Or God, why is this happening? Have you ever looked at what the theology on the other side of that question means? The theology on the other side of that question, you're saying that God is in control when things happen the way you want them to happen. But if they don't happen the way you want them to happen, that maybe God's fallen asleep at the switch. 
And you say, God, God, I know you're busy right now, but you know, can you fix this for me? Because this is not the way my life is supposed to go. I know, I know we've said that. I've said that. I know many of you have said that. I've prayed with some of you as we were saying that. And these are the questions that Daniel answers for us. Daniel, the book of Daniel, gave the exiles that hope. Yes, God is God. Yes, God is in control. And yes, God will, not can, but will rescue us. That's, that is the message of the book of Daniel. So let's get started. Let's look at verse 1, chapter... Strike that. Verse, or chapter 1, verse 9. I'm going to go through this quickly just to state my case, or state Daniel's case. Chapter 1, verse 9. God had granted Daniel favor and compassion from the chief officials. Okay, here as Daniel, the story we're all familiar with, where Daniel is given this new diet. He doesn't want to eat that diet. He's afraid of me defile him. He says, I don't want to eat it. The chief official says, hey, we got a problem here. This is what the king says you're supposed to eat. Okay, and the king is sovereign after all. After all, the king says this is what happens. That's what happens. Okay, well, that gets overturned. How does it get overturned? It's because God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the chief official's sight. Move on to verse 17. God gave these four young men knowledge and understanding in every kind of literature and wisdom. So we move on to chapter 2. This is where Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. and he's, uh, I, I'm, I'm going through this rather quickly because these are all familiar stories to us. Okay, But Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. He... He's smart enough here, okay? He calls in his officials. He calls in the magicians, the advisors, to interpret his dream. But he knows what those political advisors are like, okay? And they're going to give, them, give him the answer that he wants to hear. And that's not what he wants. This dream bothers him enough. He doesn't want the answer he wants to hear. He wants the true answer. So just to make sure they don't play politics on him, he says... You have to tell me what my dream was. And then after you tell me what my dream was, then you can interpret it for me. Well, these magicians say that. <laughs> we can't tell you what your dream is. And in fact, one that says what the king is asking is so difficult that no one can make it known to him except the gods whose dwelling is not with mortals. So they're saying that we can't do that. Only God can do that. And we'll return to verse 19. This is after Daniel. We'll go through this in more detail later. But after Daniel receives the interpretation in, in, a, in a vision at night, Daniel praises God for doing what these other people just said only God could do. Okay? Verse 19 or 20. Verse 18. I'm, verse 9, I'm sorry. Verse 19. This one right here. Okay? Verse 19 says, the mystery was then revealed to Daniel in a vision at night, and Daniel praised the God of heaven, declared, may the name of God be praised forever and ever, for wisdom and power belongs to Him. He changes the times and the seasons. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to the wise and knowledge to those who have understanding. He reveals the deep and hidden things. He knows that what is in the darkness, light dwells with Him. I offer thanks and praise to you, God to my fa God of my fathers, because you have given me wisdom and power, and now you have you have let me know what what we ask of you, for you have let us know the king's mystery. So here, God sings this song of, or not God, but Daniel sings the song of praise for doing what was just agreed to that only God can do. As so we move on, we get to. Chapter 2, verse 28. Chapter 2, verse 28. Or we'll jump back to 27 where Daniel answers the king as he's going through his dream. He says, No wise man, medium, diviner, priest, or astrologer is able 
to make known to the king the mystery he has asked about. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries. And he has let the king Nebuchadnezzar know what will happen in the last days. As we continue on towards the end of chapter 2, uh, verse 47, this is as Daniel is providing the meaning of the dream. Uh, the last half of verse 47, Daniel says, Your God is, or Nebuchadnezzar says, Your God is indeed God of gods, Lord of kings, and the revealer of mysteries. Is our God really God? Is our God really God? And remember, these are the questions these Jewish exiles had, and these are the answers they're getting. Yes, our God is God. Not this king, Nebuchadnezzar, who is probably one of the, historically speaking, one of the most successful kings in the history of the world. In the history of the world. And here, in the book of Daniel, is telling us that, yes, our God is God. In fact, our God is, has control over this king, Nebuchadnezzar. Let's move on into chapter 3. This is the story we know where Daniel's three friends are being thrown into the furnace for failure to bow down and worship the statue of Nebuchadnezzar. And I'll start in verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, we don't need to give you an answer on this, to this question. If the God we serve exists, then He can, notice can, not will, then He can rescue us from the furnace of blazing fire, and He can rescue us from the power of you, the King. Move on to verse 25. Nebuchadnezzar, this is when the three are in the furnace. Nebuchadnezzar exclaims, Look, I see four men, not tied, walking around in the fire unharmed, and the fourth looks like the Son of the Gods. We'll continue on to chapter 4. I know, you get the picture here? Is our God God? Is our God God? You get the picture of the book of Daniel is about God. And it's answering those questions. It says, at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, this was after Nebuchadnezzar has had a seven-year period of what we today might call schizophrenia. Okay? Okay. Uh, it says, but at the end of those days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, looked up to heaven, and my sanity returned to me. Then I praised the Most High and honored and glorified Him who lives forever. This is Nebuchadnezzar, that evil king. Okay, like I said, historically one of the greatest kings. He is praising and honoring Him. So is our God... Really, God? Well, Daniel screams, yes. Yes. And that, as we go through there, that is what we would today call the doctrine of sovereignty. Okay? Doctrine of sovereignty. It's a, a doctrine we have of the sovereign one. You have to say it that way. Sovereign. It has to have three syllables. Okay? It doesn't have three syllables, it does not qualify as a theologically acceptable word, okay? So you have to say sovereign, okay? But God is sovereign. He is in control. What does sovereign mean? It means the ultimate, absolute authority control. God is in control, in control of absolutely everything. The doctrine of sovereignty, all laid out there in Daniel. You can read this also in Romans. You can read it in Ephesians. But I like reading it in Daniel because when you look, God's wise, okay? He's a little bit smarter than I am. I don't know about some of you, but you know, a lot of times as I sit down and read the Bible, there are a lot of times I say, God, why don't you just give me a good systematic theology book? You know, a divinely inspired systematic theology book so I don't have to do all this work, you know? Does anyone else feel that way? No, I guess I'm the only one. Okay, but what am, what am I missing if I do that? I'd be missing 
the stories. I'd be missing reading Daniel and not only finding out what sovereignty really is, but how it works. Okay, what that what that sovereignty actually looks like in life. Okay, so as we look at Daniel. That's why I chose it to talk about sovereignty. About two months ago, Pastor Mike talked to me and said, hey, I want you on May 5th, or May 6th, this is the 6th, right? I'm not a day late. Okay, so I want you on May 6th, if you would, give a sermon on, a, on doctrine. Give a sermon on a doctrine. And I immediately knew that sovereignty was the doctrine I was going to speak on. I didn't know exactly what I was going to say about it, but I knew that would be the doctrine. And that's because... Every doctrine we have, every belief, doctrine simply means belief, okay? Again, it's, belief just sounds too simple to call it theological, so we have to call it doctrine instead of belief, okay? But every belief we have rests on the fact that God is sovereign. It rests on that. Uh, that just take the gospel. If you didn't have a sovereign God back behind the gospel, okay? if God was not in control, if there was one molecule, one atom, one particle, one, one thought, one action in the entire universe that God was not sovereign over, we'd be without hope. Or we should be worshiping that one atom that God's not sovereign over. Okay, the sovereignty of God is what the rest of our beliefs rely on. So I want you to understand that. Okay, I need you to picture a sword, if you would. Okay, a sharp sword. Now, I can't draw a picture of this, okay? Or I would, but now, now picture the edge. Just the edge of the blade, okay? That's where the sharpness is, right? That's where the sharpness is. Now picture that edge without the rest of the sword. It wouldn't do us any good, would it? Sovereignty is the rest of the sword. Sovereignty is the rest of the sword that the edge relies on. It's the, it's the rest of the sword that any of our beliefs has to have there in order to make them true. Any of them have to be there in order to make it true. This brings us to our second question. Okay, so our God is God. But will He redeem us? Will He rescue us? And again, we've gone through the stories, and we know the stories. We know the story of the fiery furnace. We know the story of the lion's den. Okay, we know the story of the, the Daniel and his three friends not wanting to change their diet and turning to God for help. We know those stories. We know God can rescue us. Okay? But we also have to remember that Daniel died a slave. Daniel died a slave. Sometimes that rescue does not look the way we want it to look. Sometimes that redemption does not look the way we want it to look. We have to remember that. Let's look at chapter 2. I want to look in more detail at Nebuchadnezzar's king, or Nebuchadnezzar's king, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. I want you to think of what it meant to Daniel. What it meant to Daniel to be able to interpret this dream. Um, as we said, Nebuchadnezzar has this dream. He's troubled by it. He draws, draws in his counselors, magicians, whatever you want to call them, his wise men, and it says... I want you to interpret this, but I don't trust you to interpret it accurately. And so and make sure I know you're telling me the truth. You have to tell me what the dream was. Then you can interpret it. And they say, well, we can't do that. No king has ever asked anyone to do that. We can't possibly do that. 
And so he said, okay, you're all going to die. You're going to be torn limb from limb. And that's what he meant, literally, guys. Okay? And so they went to Daniel. And this is where Daniel comes in. Okay? And Daniel and his friends, they pray. First, I want you to notice, what is it they pray to God for? It says, then Daniel went to his house. I'm in verse 17, uh, chapter 2. Then Daniel went to his house and told his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah about the matter, urging them to ask God of heaven for mercy concerning this menace, or this mystery so Daniel and his friends would not be killed with the rest of the Babylon's, Babylon's wise men. Okay, so he doesn't ask, hey, go ahead and give us this interpretation here. Okay, what they'd say is, hey God, we're about to be killed and we need your help. Okay, God is the one who decides how to provide that help okay so when he gets we're going to come to verse 31 is where i'm going to start reading this is where daniel has gone to the king and he's providing the interpretation it says my king as you were watching a colossal statue appear that statue tall and dazzling was standing in front of you and its appearance was terrifying the head of the statue is pure gold its chest and arms were silver its stomach and thighs were bronze its legs were iron, its feet were part, partly iron and partly fired clay. As you were watching, a stone broke off without a hand touching it and struck the, the stone on its feet of iron and fired clay and crushed them. Then the iron and fired clay and bronze and silver, the gold were shattered and became like chaff from the summer threshing floor. The wind carried them away and not a trace of them could be found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell the king its interpretation. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you sovereignty, power, strength, and glory. Notice that came from the God of heaven. And wherever people live, or wild animals, or birds of the air... He has handed them over to you and made you ruler over them all. You are the head of gold. After you, there will, be, there will rise another kingdom inferior to yours and then, another, then a third kingdom of bronze which will rule the whole earth. A fourth kingdom will be strong as iron for iron crushes the shat and shatters everything. And like iron that smashes, it will crush and smash all the others. You saw the feet of the toes and partly the parlors fired clay and partly of iron. It will be divided kingdom. Okay, So we have four kingdoms here. We have Nebuchadnezzar, and then another kingdom, a third kingdom, and then a fourth kingdom. And in verse 44 it says, in, those, in the days of those kings, those kings will be the kings of the fourth kingdom. The God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And this kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all the kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. Imagine Daniel. Daniel has the opportunity now to go in front of Nebuchadnezzar. And he goes there in front of the king and he says, King, I've got the answer to your dream. The answer is, Four kingdoms. Your kingdom, number one. And you're not going to last. Because kingdom number two is going to come in and they're going to defeat you. But they're not going to last either. Kingdom number three is going to come in and defeat kingdom number three. And they're not, kingdom number four is going to come in. But eventually, king, there is going to be a kingdom established in heaven where the Lord of lords and the king of kings will reign forever. And I'm part of that kingdom. I'm part of that kingdom. There's nothing you can do to me. Let's look at verse 44. I'm sorry, 47. I'm sorry, 44. I was right the first day. Time. In those days, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that will never be destroyed. And the kingdom will not be left to another people. It will crush all those, all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but will itself endure forever. That is where our hope is. That is where Daniel put his hope. As you go through the last part of Daniel, you start looking at all these dreams and visions, 
remember that dream and vision that was given to Nebuchadnezzar because that is the key to understanding the others. Okay, Those dreams and visions are to bring us hope. They are to bring us hope. There is a time coming. A time coming where there is going to be that kingdom established by the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, and we are all members of that kingdom. That's where our hope is. That's where our hope is. Our hope is there. Our hope is not in what happens during this lifetime. What we have to remember is we are in, all of us on this side of Genesis 3, we are in Babylon. Okay, we are exiled in Babylon, but we have to remember we are not created for Babylon. We are in Babylon. We are created for that kingdom. That kingdom that is yet to come, and that is where our hope is. That is where we have to look at the times where we have problems. That is where we have to look when we don't quite know what to tell our children about upcoming decisions. That's where we have to look when we ourselves aren't quite sure how to read the news that we've just got. That is where we have to look. That is where our hope is. And that's where Daniel points us. Can God redeem us while we're in poverty and leave us in poverty for the rest of our lives? If your answer is no, you don't understand that redemption. Can God redeem us when we're in bondage? When we are a slave of some sort and never free us? The answer is no, we still don't understand redemption. Can God redeem us as a single and keep us a single the rest of our lives, never give us that soulmate that we're looking for? If the answer is no, we don't understand redemption. Can God redeem us in a bad marriage and keep us in that bad marriage and it never gets better? Yes, if we don't, if we say no. We don't understand God's redemption. We have to remember that God's redemption points us to that end. God's redemption brings us to that final kingdom. Not today. Not today. I mean, Paul knew this. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. Paul says, And we have put our hope in Christ for, or if we have put our hope in Christ for this day life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. If our hope is what happens during the 70, 80, 90 years that we're here on this earth, if that's where our hope is, we're to be pitied more than anyone, is what Paul tells us. And, that, and Paul knew that. We can see it in Paul's life. You know, you, you, Paul's untouchable because he knew this. So we're going to kill you, Paul. To die is gain. Yeah. Okay, then we're going to let you live. He goes, hey, to live is Christ. We're going to beat you. This is why I do not consider the sufferings of this world to compare to the glories of Christ. And so, well, then we'll throw you in prison. So give me a hymnal. I'm going to convert all your guards. We're going to be singing worship. Now you can't sing. Well, then give me some writing material. I have letters to catch up on. Okay? Nothing... Nothing, you couldn't defeat Paul because Paul knew this. Because Paul knew if we put our hope in this life only, we're the most to be pitied. My friends, I just ask you now, just take a look around. Look around at your family, your church family. And we know there are people here who have questions. We know there are people here who have something they're suffering through that maybe doesn't have an end. There are people here who, mainly in the front row, who can't imagine what it would be like to have something to question. I want you to take a look 
Maybe you don't remember the names. Maybe you remember some faces. Maybe you don't know situations or circumstances, but you can remember some people. Okay? And I just ask you to make that your prayer list this week. To make that your prayer list this week. As we remember that where is our hope? Our hope is not in what happens tomorrow. Our hope is the fact that there is a God in heaven and He is in charge. He is in control of everything. He does not wake up in the morning, look in the newspaper, and says, oh my me, what have they done now? What's Randy going to do? Okay? He knows it. He is there. He is in control. And He has established a heaven. Or a, yeah, a heaven, sure. Or a kingdom. And that is where my promise is. That is where our hope is. That is where our satisfaction is. Just drive towards that satisfaction. Drive towards that satisfaction. Okay? Uh, John Piper, a man I dearly love to listen to, he has a way of taking an entire book and summarizing it into one sentence. Okay? And I don't know how many times I've heard him say that you know, God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in Him. Okay, and, and that is where our satisfaction rests, is there at the future kingdom that Daniel points us to. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank You. We thank You not only for, not only for the good times, but we thank You for all of the times for all of the times, even the troubling times, even the times where we're not sure we'll ever find the hope. We thank You because You have given us that hope. You have pointed us to where that hope stands. You have given us a way to experience that redemption, that that freedom that forgiveness that only You can provide. And Father, now I pray that You send Your Spirit to do the work that I cannot do. The work of pointing out the significance of Your message, of convicting us and drawing us, drawing us to You by pointing out and pulling us towards that hope that we have, that hope that we strive for. pray all this in the name of Jesus Christ, Your Son. Amen. Virgin.